Guruj, could you please tell us about the mechanics of Raj Yoga? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> The mechanics of Raj Yoga. I wonder if it means if all mechanics should practice Raj Yoga. <laughs> we are all really mechanics. We are the mechanics of our lives. We can tighten screws and loosen them. And of course, the most important screws to be tightened are somewhere up there. <laughs> It's fine. Raj Yoga, as you would know, Raja means royal. The royal yoga, the royal path to divine union, where the individual self merges with the universal self, where man finds union with God. That is yoga. In the world today, the word yoga has been so misunderstood. Uh, it has only been understood in the terms of all those fancy poses, hmm? all the asanas, as they are known. Although asanas has great value, but that does not constitute the entirety of Raj Yoga. Hmm? It is a part of Raj Yoga known as Hatha Yoga. Hmm? Hatha means to be very adamant on one particular aspect, hmm? that is Hatha. Hi. So that is a section of Raj Yoga. Now, many times you find teachers teaching Raj Yoga, but only a particular aspect of Raj Yoga. They tell you about meditation. Now, there are various forms of meditation. There was a question this morning about thoughts and meditation, which I did not want to answer fully, because, as I said, we're going to talk about Raj Yoga, and I can cover that point. You have some teachers that tell you, you meditate so many minutes in the morning, and so many minutes in the evening, and Bob's monk. <laughs> now that is not true. That is not true. If you meditate so many minutes in the morning and, twin and so many minutes at night and everything comes right, it is not true. It is a fallacy. It is a gimmick. Hmm? Given to a susceptible, gullible public who wants everything just instantly. Hmm? Instant coffee, instant pudding, instant self-realization. <laughs> now the path of yoga is not as simple as it seems. The path of yoga, as it has been said by Vivekananda, is the path of the heroes, the path of warriors. There has to be determination. Krishna has said, there are few types of people that want to reach me. Hmm? The one that is in distress, hmm? the one that wants worldly gain, the one that is a seeker, and last but not least, the one that has real spiritual knowledge and want to remain forever in touch with his maker. Hmm? He, does, he wants to be at home all the time and not stray away. Now, Raj Yoga, as we said, is the royal path to that union. Why is it called the royal path? Because Raj Yoga combines within itself all the other yogas. Karma Yoga, which is of right action, right thinking. Gnan Yoga, which is of intellectual analysis, wanting to find answers. Hmm? 
sacred. It combines bhakti yoga, which is the yoga of devotion and surrender and love. Hmm? Now all these, wherever one starts from according to one's temperament, they all finally merge into the one yoga, the royal yoga, Raj Yoga. Hmm? Now, as some people say that there are eight steps in Raj Yoga, they are not to be regarded as steps but they are limbs. Raj Yoga by Patanjali was called Astanga Yoga. Asta means eight, Anga means limbs, the eight limbs of yoga. Now this evening let us examine as far as you can, as far as time allows, the eight limbs of yoga. Meditation is fine but if meditation is not backed up with the first two limbs, hmm, yama and niyama, then meditation can be of <coughs> some value. It can give you some form of relaxation of mind and body, but it is not enough to lead you to enlightenment or with the oneness that we all seek. Now, what do we mean by Yama? Hmm? Yama has five aspects to it. And the first aspect of Yama is Ahimsa, which means non-violence. Now, how shall we define non-violence? Hmm? We spoke about non-killing last night. And we covered a bit of ground there. To be non-violent does not only mean the killing of living beings, hmm? of animate things, but non-violence also means a non-aggression upon ourselves and upon those around us. Now we having the animal nature in us, to become aggressive. Hmm? Perhaps not in act, but in word and thought. So here, one has to make a very conscious effort in curbing one's aggressive thought and one's aggressive word. There's a lovely Chinese proverb that says, that when you become angry, when you want to say some angry words, turn your tongue around in your mouth nine times. Hmm? Beautiful psychology that. <laughs> yes, because by the time you turn and twist your tongue in your mouth nine times, your anger will have disappeared and you will not utter those words. Hmm? You will not be aggressive because you can kill with words and we know how vitriolic some people can become by uttering <coughs> words of an aggressive nature. We can do so much harm to a person's entire life. Hmm? If we are aggressive with a stick, that wound will heal in a few weeks or a month or two. But if we leave a scar on a person's mind, that scar can remain for a lifetime. We find this parents, for example, in the ill treatment or not proper treatment or not proper upbringing of the children, leave an indelible scar for which the child, when grown up, suffers and suffers and suffers. That is one of those in distress that wants to find union. Good. After ahimsa that has to be practiced consciously, we have satya. Now satya means truthfulness. Truthfulness does not only mean uttering words of truth, but acting truthfully. Now we know how fragmented the human being is. 
His mind will think of one thing, his mouth will say another thing, and he will do another thing. Yes. yes. That is being untruthful to oneself. To be untruthful to oneself means that you say one thing, think another thing, and do another thing. So you are pulled to pieces by yourself. Now, if we can very consciously combine word, thought and deed, then we are being truthful to ourselves. And when we are truthful to ourselves, we can be truthful to others. One of the qualities of truthfulness is sincerity. Because a sincere person can never be untruthful. Every act of his, every word of his, every thought of his, because of that sincerity that is within him, will always act with the flow of nature and never against nature. And when we act with the flow of nature, which we have to do consciously, then we become truthful, we become sincere. That is the second part of what we have termed Yama. Then, we have number three, in Sanskrit is called Astay. Astaya, which means non-stealing. Now, non-stealing does not mean robbing the bank. It does not mean robbing the bank only or pickpocketing someone. Non-stealing also carries with it, within itself, truthfulness and non-violence. When we are unjust to another, we are being violent to that person. And being violent to the person, we are stealing the peace of that person. Hmm? What greater theft can there be than stealing someone's peace? Hmm? And stealing implies cheating, hmm? unfaithfulness, infidelity, promiscuity. Hmm? All these things comprise what we call astaya, non-stealing. So, it's not necessary uh, that stealing only means money, but stealing also has to do with one's lifestyle, with one's emotions, and how we harm or hurt other people's emotions. So, that is astaya. Then, in Yama, we have what is called Brahmacharya, which is the most misinterpreted word that has ever been given out into this world. Many people feel that Brahmacharya means celibacy, complete continence, yeah, non-indulgence in sex. Brahmacharya does not mean this. Hmm? Brahma means divinity. Achar means the way, the path. So to be a Brahmachari, practicing Brahmacharya, means to walk in the path of divinity. That is the true meaning of Brahmacharya. Now, to practice brahmacharya, one necessarily must exercise some form of control. Hmm? Now that control can be about eating, can be about sleeping, can be about drinking, or the sexual act. Hmm? I've told a story once, I don't know if it was here in England, where a couple came to see me. They were so, so emotionally disturbed. They had met some Swami that said, for you to reach God, 
you must practice celibacy. Hmm? No sex. Fine. They took this Swami's word. He was an intelligent man, I think. And so that is what they did. They practiced celibacy. Fine. And not being ready to practice celibacy, not having the ability to sublimate those energies. Remember, celibacy is not for householders. Hmm? It's not for married people. It is for ascetics, where they go through severe asceticism, severe austerities, whereby they could sublimate the sex energy, which is one of the strongest urges in a human being whereby they could sublimate that energy into what is called ojas hmm? or light. Hmm? Yes, that is for ascetics, not for the householder. Now to get back to our story. This couple practiced celibacy without being able to sublimate their sexual urges and energies. They started having problems, hmm? emotional problems. The husband and wife were forever irritable with each other. Hmm? They were creating unnecessary inhibitions within themselves, unnecessary repressions. Hmm? And the result was this, that they started becoming unhappier and unhappier. Where there was such great compatibility, they started becoming incompatible. Hmm? And of course, these psychiatrists made a lot of money out of it. <laughs> See, there's one sitting over there. <laughs> So they heard of me and they came to our center in South Africa and uh, I spoke to them and asked them what the problem was. Hmm? So I said, you go to bed tonight in a double bed. <laughs> yes. After a while, after a while, they came to see me again and they were their old, same old selves again, so, so happy. So, brahmacharya must not be interpreted only in the terms of complete abstinence, but it must be interpreted in the terms of walking along the path of Brahma, walking along the path of divinity, and when anyone walks along on the path of divinity, he has to exercise all forms of control within himself. So you see how non-violence, hmm, non-stealing and truthfulness also merge into that. Yama is one principle that has these various aspects which all merge into that oneness again. So, from Brahmacharya we reach Aparigra. Hmm? I'll spell it for you later. <laughs> we have Aparigra. Now, Aparigra literally means a rejection of all ties. Hmm? Now, as a householder, we cannot reject all ties. Hmm? Now, by ties, I don't mean the lovely maroon one you have on there. <laughs> the ties that are to be rejected are the unbalanced attachments. Now, we do find, we do find in the world how some people are attached to things so, so unnecessarily. Things that mean absolutely nothing. I have seen a lady uh, in whose home 
very inadvertently the maid broke the vase and she nearly had a nervous breakdown she had a nervous breakdown I don't know if she thought she was going to take that vase with her it happened but her attachment to it was so much and the attachment not only to the vase but also to the attachment of those that passed on before her her mother her grandmother and grandmother's grandmother hmm? they are gone they have reached another sphere hmm? but because of that emotional attachment all those things that passed away out of her life and that could be of no consequence in her present life were all centered in this vase hmm? that is wrong attachment good now one should not have detachment but one should have none attachment hmm? now there's a great difference between detachment and none attachment detachment means that you become indifferent you become indifferent to the world you seclude yourself from the world you withdraw yourself from the world in detachment hmm? and that in most cases is a form of escapism I always said escapism <laughs> somebody taught me the right way <laughs> escapism hmm? okay. through my travels in the Himalayas and through various ashrams and all over the world I have seen detached people all those yogis and sadhus and ascetics were nothing but escapists they could not face life they could not face the world they could not handle their problems and their <coughs> troubles so this was the easy way out there was a time in India when there were six million sadhus they call them sadhus I call them parasites living on the fat of the land not wanting to work going around begging for their food of the six million there might have been six who were sincere there might have been six the others were sick good that is escapism where they can't really handle themselves in life and they become detached from the world that is detachment what we want is non-attachment where you are functioning in the world you have your three square meals a day you love your wife and children you're close to them hmm? you have all the ties a wardrobe full hmm? <laughs> but yet you are not emotionally attached hmm? well, that is what the Bible means when it says to be in the world but not of the world hmm? that is what is meant it does not mean run away it means come be in the world hmm? and if everyone starts running away from this world I tell you what will happen the cities will be emptied and new cities will be built in the jungles hmm. so you still there where you are yes good man can never run away from himself the geographical change does not help hmm? so in non-attachment we face our problems we face them squarely and we try and find solutions and if we are sincere enough the solutions are there because there is no problem that has not the solution 
inherent in it. Hmm? The solution to every problem is inbuilt, built into the problem. Yeah. Good. Fine. So, we have talked about a parigra. Hmm? Non-attachment to these ties. It does not mean do not have ties, but to view the ties objectively. Hmm? View the ties objectively. Hmm? And when we view these ties objectively, we do forget the curse of mankind and the greatest curse on the head of mankind is me and mine. Hmm? Me and mine. This is mine, this is mine, this is mine. Hmm? If it was really ours. Hmm? As a matter of fact, we are just on loan here, on holiday. Hmm? We do not even belong to ourselves. We belong to the Almighty. Hmm? Good. But, as we spoke about the ego this morning, the ego assumes all supremacy and says, I, I, I. Hmm? That is only an idea. <laughs> it is an idea, and an idea is a function of the mind, created by the mind. So this little I, which I call I, 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 and which causes all this me and mine, is an idea of the mind. Hmm? So, when we start recognizing that all this, that, that this me, the whole world does not revolve around me. And funny enough, that's what people think. All the troubles are because they think everything revolves around them. Hmm? Everything that happens, happens to me. What me? Hmm? And, and that is why there's such little love in this world. Such little love in this world. Because everything is just me, not you, me. Now, if you write me hmm, and have a reflection of it, that me looks like we. Hmm, right. It does. Hmm? M-E. Just turn it around. We. And when we start functioning and understanding the meaning of we, then there's no me. And when there's no me, there's no mine. Good. So all this falls under a parigra. Please turn this tape over and continue on side two. the unnecessary attachments to which we have, we attach. The attach comes again. Attach so much importance. Right. So, that is one of the limbs of Raj Yoga. Now, from the Yama, we would proceed to Niyama. Hmm? Now, Niyama too has five aspects. Fine. The first aspect of Niyama is Socha. That's a Sanskrit word which means inner and outer cleanliness. Inner and outer cleanliness. Now this does not necessarily, the outer cleanliness does not necessarily refer to the body, although it's part of it. But outer in this sense could also mean environment. Hmm? and how we react to the environment. Ah. Inner cleanliness necessarily involves right thinking. Hmm? The person that has wrong thinking can never be clean inside. I was reading a form this evening, a review report, and this person just wrote two, uh, three words, four words, hmm? and they were so beautiful, I was so touched. 
she, he or she, she. that's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> this person said, I, through my practices, I feel clean inside. Beautiful. I cried. Tears came out of my eyes. How beautiful it is to feel clean inside. How do we become clean inside? Right action, right thought, right feeling. Now all these things we have been talking about can be done consciously. We can curb many of the things that happen in our lives. So we have inner and outer cleanliness. Now, if we practice yama properly, with non-violence, truthfulness, asteya, brahmacharya, and aparigra, then automatically, all these things are so interlinked, automatically we feel clean inside and outside. Now, when we feel clean inside and outside, we find santosh. Santosh means contentment. Isn't that what every person wants? Contentment. To be contented in whatever circumstances we are placed in. Now, you know, if it rains twice, oh, it's raining. If it's too hot, it's too hot. Uh, what a sad state of affairs. Feel contented. Feel contented. We spoke this morning, we spoke this morning that whatever happens to us is of our own doings. And let me be contented in acceptance, hmm? not contented in sitting back and not doing anything about it, hmm? but contented in acceptance that this is my lot hmm? and I accept this lot hmm? and not worry about it and get nervous breakdowns. That is an aspect of contentment. So, niyama contains contentment. Right. So, once through the practice of the first limb, yama, we reach niyama. Now, please remember that these things don't follow step by step. They're all intertwined. They form part and parcel of each other. By developing one virtue within ourselves, we automatically develop other virtues. If a person is kind, then automatically becomes sympathetic, hmm? automatically becomes compassionate. If he's kind, automatically he would have a sense of service, serving his fellow men. Hmm? See, so all these things are interconnected, all aspects of the one thing. Now, santosha also means keeping an equanimity in all that happens around us. Hmm? Pleasure and pain. Now, if we have developed in yama the sense of non-attachment, then we can find contentment. For then, pleasure and pain will be viewed objectively and would not have a binding karmic effect upon us. Hmm? Our problem is that we heap karma upon karma, bad or good, both are binding. But if it can be viewed objectively, then it becomes non-binding and anything which is non-binding can never add on to karma and all karma one has to pay for. Hmm? Whatever you sow, you must reap. We know that. From there, from there, it becomes a little more difficult now. We have tapas, which literally means austerity. Hmm? Now, that austerity, like brahmacharya, is also a word so, so misinterpreted. Hmm? Austerity doesn't mean that uh, you deprive yourself. Hmm? 
that if you have a bed at home, a comfortable bed, that you will go and sleep on the ground. It's not necessary. Huh? Enjoy life, enjoy. Shorter than you think. Huh? <laughs> but enjoy it in the right way. Ah. And enjoying life in the right way is austerity. Hmm? That is austerity. Enjoying life in the right way. Good. Right. Now, when a person has the required austerity, then he becomes indifferent to extremes. Hmm? Indifferent to extremes. Because after practicing the aspects of yama and niyama, then nothing can affect you. Hail, wind or storm. It does not affect you. Hmm? Because now here is a strength built up in you. Now, I want to repeat over and over again this evening that all these things come about by conscious effort and not closing your eyes for 20 minutes, morning and evening. Hmm? That is a help that gives you strength to put life itself into practice. And by putting life into practice, we live a practical life. Hmm? That's what we want. Not a sleeping life. And most people go to sleep in meditation in any case. <laughs> Good. Now, the next principle of Niyama is Svadhyay. That's a Sanskrit word which means you can have this piece of paper just now. <laughs> Svadhyay means a self-study. Hmm? Self-study. Self-study and also study of scriptures. Now, I've given you an example before. I don't know if it was here or in America or where, but it's worth repeating. What does self-study mean? Now, self-study can be interpreted as self-analysis, for one, and it can also be interpreted as self-evaluation. Hmm? Self-evaluation. Now, every evening I have a habit. Every evening, while I'm lying in bed, I review the whole day. Hmm? What have I done during this day? Has this day been lived and well lived or not? Hmm? In my case, the answer might be yes all the time, but nevertheless. <laughs> you know, I am very fun loving. <laughs> Because life is joy, so be joyful. Hmm? For example, you know, uh, one thing that hurts me very much, that our beloved Jesus, he's always portrayed with tears running down his eyes. You, you know, it's possible he might have had eye problems like me. <laughs> hmm? But one thing I tell you, that he was one of the most cheerful men on earth, because he said, be of good cheer. Hmm? And Jesus would not preach anything which he did not practice. Remember that. So be of good cheer, let's laugh. <laughs> good. So, self-study means self-analysis, and it also means self-evaluation. So when I go to bed at night, I evaluate the whole day. What I have done, and what I have not done, and what I could have done. Hmm? Pity the body is not so strong. Could have done so much more. Hmm? Good. Right. Now, here is a very simple way for self-analysis. I've spoken about it before that if a person goes through five seconds of negativity, let the next six seconds be of positivity 
you have one second in the credit balance. After that, 10 seconds go in negativity, let 11 seconds go in positivity, credit balance 2. Now, if we live our daily life consciously with the practice of Yama and Niyama, then at night we'll have the finest sleep, no insomnia. Yes, no insomnia, because we will sleep contentedly, that totaling up the day's activities, I've got so many seconds or so many minutes in my credit balance. Huh? <coughs> now, you count up all those credit balances of each day, times 365 and a quarter. Is that true? Quarter. <laughs> right. Hmm? If you tilt it all up, the year has gone good. Hmm? Times it by another 60 or 70, or as long as you want to live. Hmm? And you have evolved. You are then leaving this world. You are then leaving this world a much better place than when you came into it because you are leaving this world a better person. Hmm? Good. That is the result of self-evaluation, self-study. Now, we come to the last section of Niyama. Hmm? The Sanskrit word is Ishwar Pranidhan. Ishwar Pranidhan. Hmm? And that is what? all religions are about self-surrender to divinity. Hmm? We talk and we read about thy will be done, lip service. Hmm? As long as we have this me and mine, thee and thine are forgotten. Always. Hmm? Self-surrender would imply this very principle, thy will be done. Now, if you cannot surrender yourself to the impersonal God, the transcendental divinity, then surrender yourself to the imminent God. Is that the right word? Mm. Imminent. Personal. Yeah. You surrender yourself to the imminent personal God. Now, who is the personal God? Hmm? See him everywhere. See him in your child. See him in your wife, your husband, your friend, your neighbor. Hmm? For divinity resides in all of them. Hmm? That is the abstract becoming concrete. Hmm? So, if the mind cannot conceive of the abstract, of the impersonal God, let us conceive of him as a personal God. And that is why, that is why we believe uh, in our spiritual perceptor. That is why we believe and love hmm, Jesus. We love Buddha. We love Krishna. For that is the incarnation, they are the incarnations of the abstract made concrete to show us the way. Hmm? For the way is the life and that is the truth, hmm? the real truth. Hmm? Good. So, we have now covered very briefly, yes, very briefly, Pardon? Oh, must we do it in two parts? <laughs>